Okay, so he hello everyone. Well, welcome back to the 2021 Jetscape Summer School. And our first uh, session this morning will be led by uh, Dan Leonaj. Uh, so go, go ahead and please feel, feel free to correct my, uh, my pronunciation and we'll get started. Yes. Right, so my name is Dan Leonage and uh, I'm a PhD candidate uh, from the Ohio State University. So before we begin today's session, uh, I want to uh, tell you where you can find today's notebook and also how you can um, open it. So under the summer school 2021, there should be this folder, July 28, 29, basis of the example. And in there, uh, if you scroll down, there's this uh, set of instructions in the readme file, uh, how to, um, get to the notebook that you have, that we, have, that we will be uh, discussing today. Uh, I think you already have done this step. You have cloned the summer school uh, Git repo. So if you have done this, please make sure to do a Git pull origin master inside the summer school 2021 folder. Uh, this folder should be in your Jetscape Docker uh, folder. And uh, then you will have the most up-to-date uh, version of the notebook um, that I will be presenting today. And then you can, uh, as you have done uh, during the past couple of days, you can start your Docker container by using this command. Uh, then uh, I think you already did this uh, at the beginning of the school, but if you haven't done, please uh, do this and make sure that you have those, the most up-to-date Seaborn library uh, installed. Uh, then you can, uh, in, from inside your, uh, Docker container, you can open the Jupyter notebook using this command right here. And I know you are familiar with all of this because you have done this yesterday also. Uh, but I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And then after you run this command in the in the Docker container, you can you will get uh, this some printouts and there will be a link like this. I just copy it and paste it on your browser. And then uh, you will get uh, something like this and they are in, by clicking this uh, notebook you can go to the notebook that we'll be discussing today uh, right so just to make sure that uh, everybody uh, go to that step uh, can you uh, put a reaction on the uh, on the reaction bar if you didn't get to the step just put a cross and I will wait few more minutes until everybody is uh, ready. Uh, I cannot actually see the reactions. Can Stefan or Ron see these uh, reactions? Are there any crosses should I wait? Yeah, I'm also uh, figuring out where to look for that. I'm seeing very few reactions right now. Only I see only two, three check marks. Yeah, we'll, we'll wait. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's slowly rising, okay. but you should you should wait. Yeah. There is still yeah. majority have not responded. Okay. Yeah, and now I've, I'm seeing the same thing. Uh, we'll wait a couple a couple more minutes. Also, while we wait, uh, please make sure you also join this Slack channel. Uh, the name for today's Slack channel is uh, July 29 base. Uh, and if you have any questions, please uh, just put them in the Slack channel. And if one of our TAs uh, uh, and one of our TAs will get they are as soon as possible and answer these questions there. And if, you, if you're having any trouble connecting to Slack, uh, please uh, write something in the chat window.
Uh, are we good with the count? Can we go ahead and start? Or should we wait a few more minutes? Yeah, we're only, I'm only seeing about half of the reaction. So remember if you, if you have the Jupyter Notebook running, please uh, put a check mark in the, uh, in the reactions. And yeah, and if you have any question, please let us know in the Slack and uh, we can help you. But I think we can go ahead if there are no um, issues. All right, so uh, let me um, talk about uh, what is going to be in the today's hands-on session. So today uh, we'll show how to do a Bayesian parameter inference for, um, for relativistic heavy ion collisions. And uh, this notebook that uh, I will show today is inspired uh, from the recent Jetscape Sims paper by Derek Everett and the Jetscape collaborator. And uh, here I'm not going to introduce you to any new uh, tools or new code. I, I just use all the codes that you have uh, seen in the past two days and uh, use it uh, to, uh, do, uh, uh, to do a very realistic or uh, relativistic uh, heavy ion collision based in parameter estimation. And uh, I have not implemented, implemented every part of the Bayesian workflow, especially the extensive checks that the Matt introduced to you uh, in his notebook because of the, the time concerns that we have. I only have one and a half hour, so, but they're very important. Right? So, and I have left them for you to do as homework and I will mention them when I uh, come across them. And the relevant Jetscape papers uh, that that this, this notebook is based on our, uh, these two. And uh, I highly encourage you to go and read them. And all the results that have that are in these notebooks uh, have been uh, obtained using this uh, the, the complete code base that you can find here. And I think after going through this notebook, it will be, it'll be easier for you to go uh, to this complete code uh, uh, repository and take a look and understand what is going in there. Right, and in, the, in this original paper by Jetscape Sims Group, uh, they consider multiple models for uh, relative stick heavy ion collisions and both RIC and LHC experimental data. But in this hands-on session, uh, to keep things simple, uh, we will only consider a single model for relative stick heavy ion collisions and only the LHC experimental data. Right, uh, before we go into the session, let me, um, uh, let me explain a little bit about what will be the goal of this hands-on session. And first thing is don't worry if you don't understand each line of the code right now, the details are very important, but you can look for details uh, later on your own and try to understand them. And if you have any questions, you can ask us. Uh, but what is important is to understand uh, what happens at each step uh, and at each code block and at each function. So if you have any questions about that, make sure to uh, uh, ask them right away in the Slack and we'll get to you. Uh, and this is a summary of what's in this notebook. Uh, I have uh, four steps in this notebook. As the first step, I will talk about the physics simulation model that we will be using and pre-processing of the simulation data. And in the second step, I will talk about our validation data and the experimental data. Then I will talk about uh, building emulators for our simulation. The simulation is very computationally expensive, so we need emulators. I will talk about uh, building our emulators in this third step. And finally, I will put everything together and uh, do a Bayesian parameter estimation and uh, get the posteriors that we have been talking about uh, 
for the past couple of two days for this uh, simulation model that we that we will be looking at today. All right. Uh, so let me uh, go ahead and uh, go to our hands-on session. So in the block one of your code, you will have you have all the uh, necessary libraries, the Python libraries that we'll be using for the today's session. And uh, uh, these libraries are very well documented and uh, uh, and I will just say like, uh, when we do this, uh, in, we, when we import NumPy as NP, uh, in, in the code, when, wherever you see uh, this NP keyword, uh, just remember it is, it, it is referring back to this NumPy library. and similar to this SNS. So when you see SNS in your code, it's referring to the Seabone library and so and so. But uh, don't worry about it uh, too much. Uh, when, if you are worried about what, um, what, what, what any part of the code is doing, you can always go back to this, these libraries and treat the documentation. It's very good. And I think it will be um, very helpful. Right. So uh, then I here I this in this block two and three I define some uh, uh, name variables. They are they are just the folder structure that we have uh, for this no, this hands-on session. So all of the results that we generate in, in this uh, notebook will be under this directory called results slash figure files, and all the data that we'll be using for this session is in this directory jetscape base slash data. Uh, right, so let me go ahead and talk about the physics model that we will be using today to do our basin parameter estimation. I'm sure you have seen this, uh, this figure a couple of times during this uh, past week, but let me quickly recap uh, how we simulate a relativistic heavy ion collision. So two incoming nuclei collide and there's an initial energy deposition. We model that uh, the initial, the the initial energy deposition by using this Trento code package. Then right after the initial energy deposition, we assume the system is non-interacting and it expands like a free streaming gas. And that, uh, that evolution is modeled by a free streaming, free stream code package. And then uh, uh, we, have, we enter a quark gluon plasma phase and that evolution, this dynamical evolution is modeled by uh, a viscous hydrodynamic code, which is called, which we call the, uh, which we call the music package. And uh, then it, as it expands, it cools down and it gets converted into hadron gas phase at a certain temperature. And we do this conversion using Cooper Fry formulation. And that is taken, uh, that is, that has been taken care of by uh, this IS3D particleization module. And then this hadron gas, uh, we uh, let it decay and rescatter, and we uh, evolve it using uh, smash hadron transport code. And during the past week, you have been learning about each of these modules, and uh, I think you are very familiar with, with these uh, modules now. And all of these modules comes under the Jetscape framework, and using the Jetscape framework, you can simulate a, a relativistic heavy ion collision from beginning to the very end, where we detect the final particles. Right, and uh, so in in this session, we will consider uh, a specific uh, more specific simulation, which is late late simulations at 2.76 TeV. And here in this simulation, we will have 17 unknown parameters in the model that we will uh, try to find uh, by systematically comparing our simulation to the experimental data. And to systematically compare this uh, our simulation to experimental data and to find these model parameters, we will use Bayesian parameter inference. And Bayesian parameter inference require millions of simulations, as you know by now. And these simulations are the simulation that I show here, the, the Jetscape simulation for relativistic heavy ion collision is very computationally expensive. Uh, it takes like 20 CPU minutes on average to simulate just a single event and we need millions of them. So it's, not, it's uh, not possible to use the exact simulation to do our Bayesian parameter inference and um, to make it possible, we build emulators. So emulators uh, are, are, are cheap surrogates, computational cheap, computational cheap surrogates that can replace this computationally expensive uh, simulation. 
and to build emulators we need training data from the simulation and uh, to get the training data for this simulation model that we will be considering today we use a latin hypercube design it's a way to uh, randomly sample the 17 dimensional uh, input parameter space uh, in an even way and uh, we are not going to run the simulations today uh, we will be using the simulation that has been already done by jetscape sims group uh, in, and uh, that they use for this paper and you can uh, load these simulations from the disk uh, using this block number four and here we have this design matrix so this is the design that we use to run the simulations and if you check the the dimension of this design matrix it's uh, 485 by 17 so and if you look at just one uh, just one uh, just first five row of this design matrix you will see something like this so each row corresponds to a different design point in our 17 dimensional parameter space and each design point has um, like 17 values uh, 17 random values for our uh, model parameter and that's that they are uh, that's what you see in these columns i will talk uh, more about uh, about these model parameters that we have in our model uh, in a bit uh, right here. So uh, if you look at the Trento module, for example, there are like uh, five model parameters that we want to find uh, by comparing with experimental data. And uh, there's a parameter called the reduced thickness P and depending on the value of P, the, the shape of the initial energy deposition will change drastically as you can see here. And then there's a parameter for nucleon width, and the width will uh, decide the radius of the hotspot. And then there's a parameter for energy normalization. And then there's a parameter for the multiplicity fluctuation sigma k, that is, that controls the contrast that you see in the initial energy deposition. And then there's also a parameter like d min, which is, uh, which determines the distance between. Uh, like the average distance between two uh, hotspots or two, nu uh, two nucleons. And also there are a bunch of parameters uh, that try to uh, parameterize the, the viscosity. And, um, we, uh, in, and this, these parameters mainly appear in the music uh, code package. And uh, we, we parameterize viscosity using uh, like the shear viscosity using a piecewise linear curve I think uh, Veyo yesterday used the same parameterization for his session. So I, I think you are family, very well, fam we are very familiar with this parameterization. And in this parameterization, we have, um, they, uh, uh, they have a kink and the temperature at the kink, T eta, and the shear specific shear viscosity at the kink, uh, eta over S kink. And then we, we have two parameters, uh, the slope at low temperature and the slope at the high temperature. So that is the, those are the parameters that we will be using to um, parameterize our specific shear viscosities. And uh, we parameterize our specific bulk viscosity using a Cauchy distribution. And uh, there is also a peak here and the temperature we have, where we have this uh, peak specific bulk viscosity, we call it T theta. And then we have uh, the maximum value of our bulk viscosity. Then there's a, a, a width parameter, W theta, and then there's a, a skewness parameter, lambda. So we'll try to, uh, again, find these parameters uh, using, uh, by comparing our simulation to experimental data and uh, doing our Bayesian parameter inference. Right, so let's uh, so as i said we are not going to you know do the actual simulation now we will be using the simulation uh, that has already been done by jetscape sims group and here in this block number five you can load the simulation results uh, that i already have saved on the disk and if you look at the simulation output shape it takes uh, this uh, this shape of 485 by 110 uh, so for each design point we have a simulation output that's why we have 485 rows and we have 110 columns because in our simulation we have 110 outputs and if you look at 
Uh, if you look closely uh, at this simulation uh, mat uh, simulation matrix, you will see something like this. And as I said, each row corresponds to a, di a different design point or different set of input parameters for our model. And each column has a different observable. Uh, so let me uh, talk a little bit about the observables that we, we are using in, in our model uh, that we will be discussing today. And uh, as I said, our model is uh, going to be the late late collision at 2.76 TeV. So we are only looking at this. And we have our, our simulation model produce um, I mean, the PT integrated observables, and we are looking at six types of uh, PT integrated observables. There are these uh, charged, uh, the charged particle yields, then the identified particle yields, and also have, we have the, uh, the, the mean PT, and we have transfer energy, then there are these uh, flow coefficients, and we also have these uh, momentum fluctuations, uh, transfer momentum fluctuations. And, we measure each of these observable types in the same centrality bins as the experiments. So that's how we get all these 110 uh, observables. For example, for DN charge data, we have all these 05, 510, 1020, all these centralities. Uh, right, so we have, I think, successfully load our simulation data. So uh, our X, the the simulation design has this uh, this shape of 485 by 17. We have 485 uh, design points, and each design point has 17 parameters. Uh, and then our observable um, data, the simulation output data, has a shape of 485 by 110. Again, we have four because we have 485 design points. We have 485 different uh, simulation outputs, and each each output has 110 observables uh, with it. Right, so let me uh, go ahead and talk about um, the pre-processing of this, uh, our simulation data and the dimensional reduction of our simulation data that we do before we build the emulators. So the emulators that we have can usually train one observable at a time. So here we have uh, 110 observables and training 110 observable is difficult and is unnecessary as we will find uh, in a short time. Uh, so we, we use dimensional reduction method called the principal component analysis to reduce this uh, dimensionality of, of our simulation outputs. And the more details about PCA can be uh, found in this web article that I have linked here. I'm not going to go into uh, depth uh, about principal component analysis in this notebook, but I will show you how we use it in um, basin parameter estimation for relativistic heavy ion collisions. Uh, and before we use principal component analysis, we uh, standardize our uh, simulation uh, data. Uh, we make sure each of our observable has zero mean and unit variance uh, by using the standard scalar function. And then uh, we do the principal component uh, uh, or principal component analysis. Right. So how, so I say uh, we have to reduce our dimensionality of our data, but how do we figure out uh, what is the new dimension? What is the, is it, are we going to make it 10 dimensional, 11 dimension? How do we figure that out? So that is possible by using this, uh, this variance uh, that, that, that is associated with each principal component. So to give you a basic idea, uh, we can think about uh, a principal component as a linear combination of our 110 observables. So, each principal component is a linear combination of uh, the simulation outputs. And, uh, and if you look with each, for, with each principal component or with each of these linear combination, we can see how it varies uh, when we go uh, in our simulation data space. So the, if you look at this principal component index of so here, for example, I show uh, 10 of our uh, principal components basically the linear combinations that we get uh, from uh, doing this principal component analysis. And each linear combination has a variance uh, associated with it. That is uh, all the variance of the simulation data that it captures. And as you go to higher and higher principal component indexes or higher and higher uh, principal components, this variance that, that is captured by each principal component uh, get reduced. And 
by keeping the most uh, the dominant principal components that can that capture the most most of the variance in our simulation data uh, we can uh, we can determine the the dimensions dimensions that we that we, we should keep so for example in this uh, by looking at our uh, variance plots and also this uh, the, the the fraction of ex total variance explained plot we we can only keep uh the first 10 principal components and throw away the rest so uh, basically our uh, 110 dimensional observable outputs now we can re represent them using just uh, 10 principal components again a principal component is just a linear combination of our original uh, observables right so uh, so here by looking at this plot we decided we will only keep the first uh, 10 principal component and then uh, in this block nine, uh, we 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 just do that. We transform all of our simulation data, which was uh, which was a four eighty five by one hundred and ten matrix into our into this principal components or principal component space, and now we now our simulation data will have a shape of four eighty five by ten. So we only now we only have ten uh, uh, principal components instead of having one hundred and ten observables uh, as outputs from the simulation data and also here in this block nine i can i uh, construct this in inverse transformation matrix that allow us to go back from this 10 dimensional principal component space to our 110 dimensional observable space and we will be we the, we will be using this uh, when we build emulators and uh, i will get that get back to that uh, in, in the step number three so to recap what we have done so far, uh, we have reduced uh, the dimension of the, uh, of the, of the observables uh, or the simulation outputs from 110 to 10. Uh, and then we have, we are now uh, in, the, in the step number three, we are going to train our emulators, not for those 110 uh, observables, but for the 10 principal components. And then, uh, because we also have this inverse transformation matrix that allows us to go back from this uh, 10 dimensional space to our original 110 observable space. Uh, uh, we can uh, use that, uh, uh, we, we can use that to uh, uh, predict uh, or to emulate our simulation outputs. Uh, so this is the plan. So uh, when, we, when we train our emulators and when we have when we want to evaluate our sim simulation for a new model output we will basically get the prediction from the emulators and emulators will give us predictions for the principal component space not for the, the 110 dimensional observable space but for the principal component space and then we apply this inverse uh, transformation matrix or inverse transform that we found uh, in our principal component analysis and to get back to the original observable space of 110 dimension. And uh, I will talk about how to build the emulators um, and how do we do this prediction and how this uh, transform is applied in the, in the next uh, steps. Uh, right. Dan, do you want to do a, a check-in to right. see if everyone's? So, yes, I think uh, we can do a five, we can take a five minutes break and also answer uh, if you have any questions. Uh, we can start the session again, maybe at uh, 9.40. And then uh, shall we have people uh, hit the checkbox in the reaction when, when they catch up to this point? Yeah. Yeah. Dan, do you, wanna, do you wanna take a survey with the reactions? Right, yes. So if uh, if you are good up to this point, just uh, check the OK mark. And if you have any questions, uh, or if you didn't get to this point yet, press the cross mark and uh, we'll wait. I think we can actually take a break for uh, for five minutes and uh, we can start the session again at 9.40 and give people some time to uh, wind down and uh, think about what happened so far. And and then I'd also like to point out we're in the July 29th Bayes channel right. in the Slack. 
under the summer school Jetscape Summer School 2021. So there are two. There are two for July 29th. We're in the one without the uncertainty. So it's just called July 29 dash phase. And yeah, so if you're having any going on in there right now. Yeah. So if you're having any issues, uh, you can also post 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 any issues to that channel and you, you'll get more individualized attention. Okay. Right, so uh, let's go to the step number two. Uh, and here I'll talk about the validation data and the experimental data. Uh, that we will be uh, using for this session. And uh, the validation data is basically, again, a set of simulation data that will be, gener that will be, uh, that will be generated using a Latin hypercube sampling design, uh, similar to what we did uh, to get the simulation training data. And uh, we are going to just load the validation uh, data that has been generated by Jetscape Sims group uh, from the disk and if you from this block 11 you can load this and if you check the validation design shape uh, it will have this 95 by 17 shape for the, the design matrix and the simulation outputs have the shape by 95 by 110 and so this means that we have 95 validation points so basically this is this, this 95 points are again uh, they have been randomly sampled from our uh, input model parameter space uh, and we have done the simulation for each of these design points and got our outputs uh, from the simulation and stacked them on in this uh, simulate validation simulation uh, matrix. And uh, the important thing to remember is the validation, this validation data set is completely independent of uh, the earlier data set that I showed, the simulation uh, training data set, which was like 485 by uh, 17 dimensional data set and uh, uh, and we have this validation data set for several reasons and uh, if you quickly look at what is in the inside this validation design and you can see it's very similar to uh, what we saw in the in the simulation training data set uh, this columns corresponds to different model parameters and we have 95 of them uh, so we have 95 design points and again okay, and if you look at this uh, data if, if you look in this validation simulation matrix, you will see uh, each column corresponds to a different observable. We have 110 of them. And then also we have simulation error that we calculate uh, from, from uh, for our simulation. And uh, again, for each observable, we have uh, associated error with it. And what why do we need this validation data set and what is it used for? And, uh, I think you have seen a couple of uh, instances where this is used, especially in maths and uh, warehouse uh, notebooks. Uh, the first use of this validation test, validation data set is uh, when we build our emulators using the simulation data that I showed you earlier, we have to make, we, we need some, uh, some kind of a reassurance that our emulators are good, right? Uh, we need to be sure that our emulators are performing well. So to, to, to do that check, we can use our validation data. We can uh, we can use our simulation and uh, uh, run uh, the. I mean, we already have this simulation output as the validation data. These are the real. These have this. These are the. Uh, this if we use our validation design matrix and run the actual simulation, these are the outputs that we get. And also, if we have, if we build the emulators using the simulation training data. Uh, we can try to predict uh, the observables from our emulators, you know, like for each of these uh, validation design points, we can try to put these validation design points and use the emulators to predict an observable for, the, for our simulations use for each of these validation design points. And then we can, we have, uh, here we have the actual simulation output, which is this, which is in this validation simulation matrix and also we have, uh, we will have the outputs that we get from the emulator. So by comparing these two, we can, uh, we can, uh, we can assess the, 
the, the quality of our emulators and it's a very important check in any Bayesian parameter inference. Um, but I have not performed it here, but I will leave it as, uh, leave it for you to do as homework. You have all the necessary data set and you also have the code in Matt's notebook. So I encourage you to go and uh, try to uh, implement this in your, by yourself here. Uh, and also the second use of our, uh, our validation uh, data set is we can use them, this validation data set to validate our entire Bayesian workflow. Uh, and that is uh, the case that, that I will be talking about mostly in this notebook. Uh, basically what we do is uh, we take one of our validation points as our fake experimental data. For example, in this case, I, I assign this uh, the first simulation output of our validation uh, data set and I take it as I take it to be my fake simulation data and I uh, I get the simulation uncertainty of this validation simulation set as my experimental uncertainty as my fake experimental uncertainty and then forget I, I'm, I'm going to forget for a moment that I know the actual real model parameters that generated this uh, this validation uh, observable. And I mean, it's actually here. I'm, go I'm just going to forget that I know this, uh, the, the actual model parameter that produced this uh, output from our simulation. And I'm going to do a Bayesian parameter inference um, and try to infer the model parameters. And now, because I know the true model parameters that I used to generate this data, I can compare the inferred model parameter values with the true values to see how good uh, to assess the quality of my Bayesian workflow. And this is usually called a closure test. And that is what I will be performing um, in, this, uh, in this notebook. And if you, uh, and, and um, if, if this is successful, then you can go ahead and use the real experimental data here and the real experimental uncertainties and rerun this notebook to get uh, to do uh, uh, a Bayesian parameter inference with the, the real experimental data. But for the for the for the easy of explanation, uh, I will in this notebook I will use I will do this closure test uh, in this session. Right. So let me run this, and you can see uh, the shape of our experimental observable or the pseudo data or the fake experimental observable is 110 as it should be. We have, we should have 110 observables. And they also, the, our experimental errors also have a length of, uh, it's a vector of uh, length 110, right? So now let me uh, plot this fake experimental data just to get an idea uh, of uh, how it looks. And uh, so these five blocks that you see in this section, they are just there to make uh, a beautiful plot. So don't worry too much about uh, this, uh, this protein routines. Uh, they, are, they have nothing to do with the Bayesian inference. They are just there to uh, make the plot that you will be seeing soon. Uh, right, in this plot. 18, right, so this experiment, this plot. So if you run these five uh, code blocks, you will get this, uh, this plot. Let me just, yeah, let me zoom out a little bit. So this is basically our fake experimental data, or oh, this is the output of our, well, for our first validation uh, design point. And you can see we have all those 110 observable in different similarities plotted in this, uh, in this beautiful plot. Uh, Right, so let's, uh, so as I said, we'll use this as our experimental data and try to do the Bayesian parameter inference. And then we will compare the posteriors that we get uh, with the, the, the true model parameters uh, that we have. Right, so before we get to the Bayesian parameter inference, there's one more step. Uh, I have not yet talked about how to actually build our emulator. So, that is what is that is uh, what I'm going to do right now. Uh, and now uh, in this section, I will talk about how we build our emulators for the ten principal components. Remember, we are not going to build emulators for our observable space, but we are going to build the 
our emulators for uh, the reduced dimensional space or the principal component space that we have. And we have uh, the dimensionality of that space is 10. Uh, so here we will build a, an emulator for each of the principal components. Um, and in this block number 10, I have, I just load uh, the parameter ranges, uh, the, the parameter ranges for the model parameters that we have in our model. So for example, the normalization uh, parameter in our model, uh, we vary it between 10 and 20. The trend topy is varied between point, minus seven and point seven. So like that, we have these bounds for our, um, our model parameters. Um, I mean, they are, they have been chosen. I mean, uh, uh, thinking about realistic conditions and we, we expect our nucleon width to be between, for example, we ex uh, expect our nucleon width to be between 0.5 and 1.5. So that's how we, uh, we have these bounds. And uh, we use these bounds also when we simulate our data and all, uh, both the validation and the simulation training data. And also these bounds are important when we try to train our emulators to give them an idea, this is uh, the bound that we expect our input model parameters to vary. And in this uh, block right here, I train uh, our emulators for each of the principal components. And um, you have seen this code before. This is the same. Uh, this is the same code that Veo used yesterday for his session, but in. In, uh, in his session, I think he had only three principal component. And here, if you look at uh, this code block right here, you can see I have 10, uh, I'm training 10 uh, emulator. And each of uh, my emulator is going to be a Gaussian process. And this uh, line here specifies the kernel of my, what is going to be the kernel of my Gaussian process. and uh, I think you are now you are already familiar with what is a kernel. We had a, a nice session about a nice introduction to the Gaussian processes, and he talked about the how to choose a kernel and what are the types of kernel that we have here uh, to uh, to build emulators for our for our simulation. I use a, <clears throat> excuse me. I use a, a RBF kernel or an exponential kernel. And also I have added a white noise to this kernel because uh, our simulation that we have here or the simulation outputs uh, are actually stochastic. Like they also have, they have a white noise component associated with each of our, uh, each of the outputs uh, because for each design point, we uh, simulate um, like thousands of uh, characteristic heavy ion collisions and then we use all of the uh, particles that we get from the simulations to calculate our observers. So uh, we expect that there to be uh, uh, some kind of a stochastic noise component in our observable. So that's why we have used a white noise kernel um, in addition to this uh, the usual exponential or the RBF kernel. Uh, then here uh, in this line, you can see I, I use uh, each of the uh, I use the principal component transform data and I use uh, each of the principal, I, I build a Gaussian uh, emulator, Gaussian process emulator for each of the principal components. Um, and here I have this parameter, this restart optimizer to four. So we train each of our emulator four times. We try to retrain it uh, multiple times to make sure we have the most uh, optimized uh, emulator. Um, and that's it. Like uh, this is uh, how we build the emulators for our Gaussian, uh, for our simulation. And this, and again, I would remind that these emulators are again for the principal component, not principal component space, not for the actual observable space. I will talk about how we go back to our observable space in the um, in the next code block. But uh, this is, uh, but in this block nineteen. We build our emulators and our, we, are, we train our emulators. And right now in this session, um, I have set this flag to false. So you won't be training the, the emulators in, the in this session if you run it. Instead, you will just lo load uh, the saved emulators from the disk. But I encourage you to change this uh, flag to true and try to run this. And 
uh, try playing with this kernel and try uh, try adding uh, like different types of kernels here and see what happens um, uh, maybe later on your own time uh, right so then i will talk about this function in the block number 20 and i think this is uh, one of the most important functions in this notebook this is basically predict this function basically predicts uh, the observables of for, for our simulation uh, using the emulators and without running the actual simulation um, so this this function takes uh, uh, an input of a 17 dimensional vector so that is basically uh, the 17 model parameters so we can give this function any uh, set of input model parameters and this function will use <coughs> the emulators that we have trained in this in this uh, block number 19 and it will calculate it will predict first here if you look at this line of code it will first predict our um, uh, the emulator outputs in the principal component space and we will have uh, that in this mean vector so that's what happens as a first step when we give it a 17 dimensional model parameters uh, vector it will first predict the output uh, or it will first predict uh, what should be the principal component um, that corresponds to this model uh, parameter uh, model parameter vector then we use the the infer inverse transformation matrix that we found when we did the principal component analysis to transform uh, this uh, this prediction in the principal component space to our observable space and that's what happens in this line and here also we have to transform so each of these emulators also will predict a, a error uh, uh, associated with each of the principal component so we also have to transform this prediction error to our original uh, observable space so when we do when we go from this 10 dimensional emulator prediction to our our real observable space we also have to transform this uh, the error associated with each of the principal components and that is done by uh, the line right here so we construct this ap or the inverse transformation matrix and we use it to uh, transform we basically sandwich our the, the predicted variance from our uh, emulators between this transformation matrix the, the transformation inverse transformation matrices to get back to the observable space um, and uh, and these functions return basically when we input uh, the input our any 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 model parameter value uh, when we input it to this function it basically returns uh, what the simulation what the, the simulation output uh, or it predicts the simulation output and also it it predicts the error associated with this uh, this output and we will be using uh, and this function is going to uh, save a lot of computational time for us because now we don't have to run the simulation the actual simulation to uh, you know get our simulation outputs we, instead we can just use this function uh, and these emulators that we have trained to get uh, or to predict our uh, sim uh, to predict what would be our simulation output and also we can get the get this prediction with a quantified error and that is very important for uh, to have a reliable uh, Bayesian parameter inference it's important to quantify all the uncertainties that we have and i want to bring up one thing uh, here uh, it, this it is this nice uh, jetscape sims uh, tool that we that you can find uh, in this link uh, right here and basically uh, here you can find uh, this function the, the the function that this that predicts this observer for example this is where you set uh, your values of this the 17 uh, of your 17 model parameters so you can set these values to any any uh, any value between these bounds and here on these plots, you can see these 110 observables that will be predicted by a function similar to what I had in, in my notebook. 
and this is very nice and i think by playing with this you can get a very good intuitive idea about uh, the relative stake uh, heavy and collision model that has been used by the jescape sims group and i encourage you to uh, play with it and try to get try to understand what is going on and how this observable change when you change these parameters and uh, so it's a fun exercise right so let me uh, move on and uh, here i also want to mention that uh, i have omitted some essential checks in uh, in any bayesian parameter inference task uh, uh, i have as i said before i have i have omitted the emulator validation checks and i i leave it uh, for you to do as a, a homework uh, you already have the emulation validation data here you have the emulators so uh, it's just a matter of writing uh, like few lines of code to perform this emulation validation checks and you can use matt's notebook uh, and look at how he does it there and also wayo's notebook uh, to write this on your own um, and also Uh, there's one thing that I haven't uh, checked before I move on to the Bayesian parameter inference. It's called a prior predictive check. So it's just there to see if if our if our model is capable to capture uh, the experimental data uh, that that we uh, that we will observe. Uh, and it's, I think Matt talked extensively about these prior predictive checks in his notebook, and I have not done it here, but I encourage you to. Uh, go ahead and do it. Uh, do it on your own, uh, and you have everything that you need in this notebook uh, to do it. Right. To sum up uh, what we have done so far, uh, uh, we now have a fast way to predict observers, all 110 of them, and also uh, we have a way to get the prediction uh, error matrix for any um, point in the input model parameter space. Of course, within within those bounds. Uh, that i showed you earlier right so let me go ahead and move on to uh, the last step the step number 4 uh, where i talk about the actual bayesian parameter inference and maybe i'll i'll, I'll take few minutes uh, to check with you to see if you are following it or if you have any questions up to now you can uh, use a reaction uh, just to uh, use the cross sign if you if you need me to wait a little bit more and use the the green sign uh, if you think i can go ahead and talk about uh, the bayesian parameter inference this is our final step so i think we have uh, plenty of uh, we have enough time so there's no hurry just please let me know if you have any questions up to this point I see six or seven check marks mm. and no cross signs. Uh, we had <coughs> we had we had eight last time. So if okay. you're, yeah, I didn't I didn't memorize all the names. If you're so if you're having trouble or need more time, uh, use use the red uh, the red X. Or send a comment uh, to Slack. There's there's lot, lots of help available uh, on the Slack channel. Okay, I think I think we'll call that acceptable attrition. Right. Yeah. And and keep going. Right. So let me uh, go to our final step, the step number four, the Bayesian 
parameter inference. And here I'm going to put everything that we have done so far uh, together and to do our basic parameter inference. And uh, I know you have seen this formula a couple of times between uh, in this week, but I'll just do a quick recap. So Bayesian interpretation of probability, uh, let us assign probability to any hypothesis based on the knowledge we have about it. And under this interpretation, this Bayes theorem becomes a very powerful inference tool. And that is what we'll be using in today's session. Uh, so here we have on the left side of the equation, we have the posterior, the probability of our model parameters, given that we have observed our experimental data. So this posterior is what we are after, and we can find it by using uh, this, uh, by, by finding these terms in our right-hand side. So this first term is probability of the experimental data given the model parameter values theta, and we call it the likelihood. This is basically how likely is it to observe, this is basically quantify how likely is it to observe the experimental data by experiment given our model parameter value theta and we use a normal uh, Gaussian likelihood uh, to, uh, for this probability distribution. I will talk more about it in, in a few seconds. And then uh, the other important thing is this P theta, that is the prior. And here we encode, or here we choose this probability distribution to encode the knowledge that we have about the model parameters before we see any of the experimental data. So, uh, I will, look, I will also talk about this prior in a bit. And in this uh, denominator, we have the evidence. Uh, it's the probability of the experimental data. And this is basically uh, a normalization constant and it does not depend on theta at all. So for a basic parameter inference, this is, uh, this is not that important, uh, but it is a very, it becomes a crucial or very important quantity when you Thinking of, when you think about uh, model comparison or Bayesian model average averaging, uh, I think uh, Matt talked about a little bit and he has some material in his notebook about uh, the use cases of this evidence, but I'm not going to talk much about it. I will talk about the likelihood and the prior, which we will need, which are very essential to for our Bayesian parameter inference. And I, I again uh, want to rem remind you that uh, here, I'm not doing uh, actual uh, Bayesian parameter inference using the real experimental data. I'm doing this, uh, I'm using this fake experimental data, which are just this, which are just the simulation output uh, for a known uh, set of parameters, which I call theta star here. And I use uh, the, I used one of the validation data actually for this purpose. And we will, uh, we will perform this closure test and we will try to infer our model parameters and compare it with the true model parameters that we know to assess the quality of our Bayesian workflow. And that is the goal of this notebook. And, uh, and I, have, uh, I have left it for you to do as a homework. Uh, I mean, you just have to change the experimental data that I used here uh, to the real experimental data and then you can run the same notebook to do the basic parameter inference with the real experimental data. And I have left it for you to do as a homework. Uh, and let, yes, let's uh, go ahead and talk about each of these terms now uh, and try to find uh, try to uh, find the posterior. So the prior uh, that the prior term that appears in this Bayesian uh, inference or the Bayes theorem, uh, and here in this uh, in, in Bayesian relativistic heavier and collision, actually, even in that the just kept since paper, we have assumed a uniform prior for the parameters. And uh, that basically means uh, if our uh, parameters are within these bounds, then we say the probability is one. If these parameters are outside these bounds, uh, then we say the probability is zero. So uh, for to use the Marco chain Monte Carlo sampling. So that's what we are going to do use ultimately as you have seen um, in past couple of notebooks uh, to use that uh, actually what we need is not the prior probability but the log of the prior probability. We need that uh, as a function. So that's what I have implemented here in this block 21. And you can see if, I, if, this, uh, if, if our model parameters 
satisfy this condition. If they are inside the lower and upper bound, uh, I output zero. And if if they are not uh, within these bounds, I I output for this function evaluates a negative infinity. It just um, gives out a very large negative number. So that's how we evaluate our prior. Then in this uh, in, in in this section, I would like to talk about the likelihood. Uh, and to evaluate the likelihood, we use this function. Uh, this this is basically a generic function that evaluate multivariate normal multivariate normal look likelihood. We have also talked about this uh, in this session yesterday. Uh, basically, what does this what what this function do is it evaluates this expression. So when you uh, input a y a difference vector y and a covariance matrix, it ever it evaluates this uh, this this normal uh, uh, this quadratic expression take the transpose of the the difference vector and take the inverse of the covariance matrix and again and again multiply it by it with the the difference vector and this is just the log expression for a multivariate normal distribution and we use this function because this is this use this lapac library which is a low level Linear algebra library, which can do these inversions and which can do this uh, multiplication uh, very quickly and uh, and very efficiently. And this is uh, the this is uh, basically uh, evaluate uh, a multivariate multivariate normal log likelihood. That's what this function uh, does. And the likelihood that we have uh, uh, for us for when we do this Bayesian parameter inference takes this form uh, we have here we have the experimental data minus the so this is basically the probability of the experimental data given theta so this uh, this probability we evaluate using this normal uh, multivariate normal distribution and here this term is basically the experimental data minus the simulation output data and we get this uh, simulation output not by for the model parameter theta, not by running the actual simulation, but using the emulators. So that's the whole purpose. That's why we went through all the trouble uh, to get our to to construct our emulators so that we can evaluate this term that appears in the likelihood when we do uh, uh, Marco chain Monte Carlo sampling for our posterior. And here we have this uh, error covariance matrix. It's it's, it's actually the addition of the experimental error plus the the uncertainty or the pre, the simulation prediction error covariance matrix and i think um, after 10:30 today um, um, he will talk uh, a lot about uh, this this covariance structure and this error covariance matrix uh, and yeah this is uh, this is basically the likelihood that we will we have for our session um, and also that has been used in the Jescape Sims paper. And uh, so now uh, I, using this uh, multivariate normal log likelihood, I can evaluate uh, the log likelihood uh, that, that we need. And, and as you can see, we have the, the difference vector to be the prediction minus the experimental uh, data or experimental vector. And then we have the total variance to be uh, the experimental variance plus uh, the prediction variance or prediction covariance and prediction error matrix. And then we use the we put these two in into our multivariate normal look likelihood function. It, it needs this, this difference vector and the total variance. That's it. And then it will evaluate uh, the probability, the log probability that we need. So that is how we get the log likelihood. And now, uh, since we have the log prior and the log likelihood, we can write our log posterior. And this is uh, this is going to be our log posterior. We have uh, so you know the posterior is basically the the multiplication with the prior and the like log uh, and the likelihood. So if you take the log, it just becomes an addition. So that's what we have here. We add the log prior to the multivariate normal log likelihood. And that's how we get our posterior or the log posterior, right? So now we can go to go and try to sample uh, this log posterior using the Marco chain Monte Carlo sampling. That's what happens in the block number twenty-five. 
And here I use exact same uh, sampler that Matt used in his notebook. It's uh, the PTMC sampler. And uh, I'm not going to run the sampling now because it will take some time. This is a huge, this is 17 dimensional uh, uh, posterior. So, um, so if you don't have enough, it will it'll take uh, at least two, three hours to complete uh, the sampling. So right now I'm just going to put this into false and load the sample that I have already on the disk. But I encourage you to uh, play, play with this later on your own time. Uh, so we, this sampling method needs the, the likelihood and the prior, and then it'll it will uh, construct the posterior inside and then it will uh, initial, initialize these workers and some sample and uh, there's a there's a burning period of 500 samples and then we take thousand more samples uh, and there are like 200 uh, chains uh, so after we run this sampling method we will have a, a sample sample of uh, sample set of 20000 and these 20000 we need to check if they actually came from the posterior or we need to check and make sure that our, that we can trust this Marco chain Monte Carlo samples. But I have not done it here. I have left that checks as for you to do as a homework. So you know the convergent test and the test, the, the trace plots that Matt showed in his notebook, you can try to uh, generate them here and see uh, if we can trust these samples, but uh, for now, I'm just going to take these samples and then um, try to uh, generate uh, the posterior plots and the corner plots that we need to analyze um, our Bayesian parameter inference. Uh, and if you look at this, this sample uh, matrix, you, you will see something like this. It has like 20,000 rows and each row has these uh, 17 um, values. These are just samples that have been taken from the posterior. <clears throat> And here we have a code that in the block number 26, we have a code that tried to find the map parameters. So the map parameter is basically the mode of the posterior. So you can think about these parameters as the most uh, probable values uh, of the model. Uh, these are like point estimates. So since we are doing, we have all posterior, um, it's kind of constraining to only look at the map, map values. So we encourage you to explore the posterior and it is generally encouraged to look at the posterior but uh, here I just try to look at the map values and to see uh, how so these are basically we can think about as, as the as the uh, as the inferred value that we got from our Bayesian parameter infer inference and I'm going to compare this uh, the, the map values that we get from our posterior with the true value because we use the fake experimental data so we know what are the actual true values that generated this data. So I'm going to compare these two and see uh, how good is our Bayesian workflow. That's the goal here. And the, as I said, the posterior distribution is a 17 dimensional distribution. It's very hard to visualize a 17 dimensional distribution. So what we do is we use this uh, corner plots. Basically these are just marginal distribution. So you have the 17 dimensional uh, probability distribution and if you um, integrate over the variables you can get the marginal distributions for example if you look at the plots that i show here and if you look at this plot right here on the y-axis you have the switching temperature on the x-axis you have this trend of p parameter and you get this joint marginal distribution plot by integrating your posterior integrating out all other variables in your posterior so that's how you get these kind of projections that you see here uh, of the joint uh, probability distributions. Um, and we call this type of plots, the corner plots. And you have uh, seen these type of plots before in the, in the yesterday's Bayesian session. So I think you understand uh, what's, what we have here. And I want to emphasize uh, this, uh, the map and the truth value that I show in these plots. So the map value, the, the mode of the posteriors are in this blue, uh, dots and the true values that I use to generate the our experimental data is in this uh, are shown in this red red color, and by looking at these plots, you can see that some of our parameters are 
uh, very well constrained our from our Bayesian parameter estimation. For example, this parameter, which is the sigma k, it's a it's a parameter in our Trento module. It is well constrained here in our closure test, and uh, also the, this normalization parameter. It also nice is nicely peaked uh, in our truth value. So uh, and also there are some parameters that are not that well constrained. For example, this this minimum distance between the nucleus, it's not very well constrained. It's it kind of has this flat distribution and we cannot be really sure about what is the uh, what, is, what is the inferred model value, inferred uh, parameter value uh, that we should pick for that. Uh, but other than that, I think we can uh, be happy with our closure test. And uh, I mean, this is just a single closure test. So we have to perform multiple closure tests to be actually be satisfied and say we are, we are good uh, and we can move on to the Bayesian parameter inference, but this closure test alone uh, looks fine. And uh, I also want to mention that by looking at these types of plot, you know, uh, like these joint distributions, we can extract much more information than just by looking at these map parameters or just single point estimate. For example, uh, it's clear from these plots that there is some correlation between the the nucleon width parameter W and the free stream time. There's a positive correlation. And uh, but if you go to the Jetscape Sims paper and uh, look at their discussions, they discuss extensively about uh, the information that is that they can extract from this type of posteriors. So I highly, highly encourage you to go and read uh, read, the, read that paper and uh, see, uh, see what they say, uh, see what information that they extract from uh, looking at a posteriors like this. And these are just, I mean, we had 17 parameters in our model. So I just, here I just show the parameters that are not related to the viscosity and you can uh, get sim similar plots for the similar posterior plots <clears throat> for our uh, viscosity uh, parameters. And that's, this is how they look. And uh, maybe uh, this, so, you know, like the specific shear viscosity is parameterized or the temperature dependence of the specific shear viscosity has been parameterized using these four parameters. And you can see the, how, they post, how the posterior look for these four parameters. And these are the, the marginal plots. Maybe there's a better way to visualize this rather than looking at uh, these parameters that parameterize the temperature dependence of the viscosity. We can directly go and construct uh, the the the, fun, the temperature dependence of posteriors for temperature dependence of the viscosities using these samples. We can just you know take this take these samples and generate curves and plot uh, on with the temperature axis on the x-axis and the shear viscosity on the y-axis, and that is what we have done here in this uh, in this block block number thirty-four. Here you have uh, basically we have use the, the parameters or the posterior samples that we had for our uh, specific shear viscosity parameters and uh, draw, then we, I mean, each, each sample corresponds to a curve in this plot. And so we have uh, plot all of the curves in this plot and then identified the 60% and the 90% credible intervals uh, that we have uh, from our posterior. So in, in this, this red color, you have uh, the, the truth, or oh, this is what I chose uh, uh, as my model parameters or, uh, or the temperature dependence of my specific shear viscosity when I generated the, the fake experimental data. And here you can see our priors, the 60% credible interval nicely captures the, the, the true, uh, the truth or the true model, uh, the true temperature dependence of the Specific, specific shear viscosity that I used to generate the, uh, the, the fake experimental data. And uh, we can generate a similar plot for our uh, specific bulk viscosity. And that's what you see here. And again, this red line is the true uh, temperature dependence of the specific bulk viscosity are used to generate the, the fake experimental data. And this 60% uh, interval confidence interval that you see here that is uh, that we found using our posterior nicely captures uh, this uh, the truth 
and uh, I think and and that's good and th that makes uh, that makes this uh, the closure test successful and uh, this is this hints us that uh, we can trust our the Bayesian workflow and again this one closure test is not enough you have to uh, uh, do multiple closure tests to be satisfied with your uh, you know the Bayesian workflow but so far it's looking good and um, until now uh, we have compared our you know the true model parameters to the inferred model parameters but um, there's another check that we can do uh, to uh, to be to uh, to see if we have successfully uh, inferred uh, our model parameter that is we can that is by you know do doing a forward evaluation so we can take the the mode of our posterior or the map prediction values and then we can try to predict uh, uh, the simulation output using these map values and try to compare it with the the, the experimental data that we that we use um, to uh, to do this Bayesian parameter inference. So that is what is going on this uh, block number 29 and this 32. Um, and when you do these predictions, so the map predictions are in these solid lines and the experimental data that we use are in this, um, this little triangulars. Uh, we see that they agree uh, very well. And uh, uh, this, this is another hint that our, that our closure test has been successful. And a better test would be to do actually, you know, uh, to do uh, to take the the samples from our posterior and do uh, uh, simul and do predictions, multiple predictions for our simulation and do kind of a, a posterior predictive check. And but I have not done it here. I just use the the map values, uh, the the mode of the posterior, and then uh, try to predict the simulation uh, data. Uh, and then try to compare it with the experimental data to see how how to uh, to see how they agree with each other. But you can also do this. Uh, the, you can use the full posterior and do the prediction uh, for the simulation, and then compare it with the experimental data to get a better idea of how uh, how successful is your Bayesian parameter estimation. I have not done it here. I think in Matt's notebook uh, he had it. So I encourage you to go and uh, try to uh, implement that in, in this notebook, the posterior predictive check. Uh, and again, you have all the necessary material that you need to do it. And uh, I think that will be a really nice exercise. Um, and I here I summarize all the things that I didn't have in this notebook, but are, that are very important and you have, that you have seen in the the other notebooks that you uh, that we that we presented in the last two days. So I highly encourage you to go and try to implement uh, each and every uh, check or uh, part that I list here. And I think it's the best way to get familiar with this material and to learn this uh, this Bayesian parameter estimation methods is to code is to do coding and to get your hands dirty by doing the actual code and. Uh, I highly encourage you to do this and let us know if you uh, if you have any questions about this on the Slack, chat, Slack thread and we'll be happy to help you uh, out. So thank you very much. Uh, this is the end of our session and good luck. And I will take any questions if you have uh, if you have any on the Slack thread. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Let me, let me also, I mean, if someone wants to unmute and ask a quick question, I think we can also, we can also take that since we're at the end now. Uh, but the, the Slack channel works just as well for questions. And then I'd, I also want to uh, uh, emphasize uh, and encourage everyone to do the homework uh, exercises. This this Jupyter notebook is represents an, an enormous uh, amount of work, um, but I think the it, it's it's almost too easy to sit and and run through it. Uh, and I think you'd, starting some of the exercises will really help cement some of the concepts. And uh, I 
I think we will be monitoring the Slack channel from here in, in the future. So if people do the exercises over the next week and send their questions to the Slack channel, uh, Dan, or you, you can confirm, right. I think we, we will continue to monitor it. Right, right, yes. Yeah, we, I, we can't guarantee a 30 second turnaround to all the questions, um, but certainly within 24 hours, uh, and, and probably most questions will probably be answered within a few hours, right. just right. judging from past experience. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, to do all this homework, the code that you need and the example that you need were already in the previous notebooks. So you can also, this will be a nice exercise to remind, uh, you know, to get everything that you have learned about Bayesian uh, methods uh, and put it, to, put it into practice and in my opinion, that's the best way to learn this subject, or any subject for that matter. Right, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Then I'll uh, hand it over to Yi. Uh, okay, Yi, yeah, Yi, do you want to take a, a five minute break before we resume? Uh, yeah, I think let, let's, let's do that. So we can start uh, 10.35. If that works.